Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jeff Mankoff. I am a non-resident associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this panel on Russia's war in Ukraine, geopolitical implications for Eurasia. Since the war in Ukraine started uh, about a month and a half ago, the world has endured a number of what uh, Karl Marx famously termed days in which 20 years are embodied. The implications of this war uh, are still being felt and will be felt for many years to come, not only in the immediate neighborhood uh, of Eastern Europe, but in a much wider geographic space as well. And with all of the focus that's been uh, devoted to trying to understand the drivers and consequences of this conflict, uh, I think an underappreciated element is the ways in which it's changed the geopolitical calculations of countries somewhat far uh, from the immediate borders of the conflict, but that nevertheless are affected very seriously by events that are happening there. So today we have a, a terrific panel uh, of experts on Turkey, the South Caucasus, and Central Asia, who are gonna be talking in turn about the ways in which the war in Ukraine is affecting the geopolitical outlook uh, and uh, actions of countries in these regions. Uh, we're going to start with Professor Liesl Hintz, uh, who's an assistant professor of international relations at the Johns Hopkins uh, University School of Advanced International Studies, who's going to talk about Turkey. Then uh, we'll go over to Alessa Vartanian, who is a senior analyst for the International Crisis Group uh, based in Tbilisi, who's going to be talking about the South Caucasus. And then finally, uh, we'll pass the baton to Nargis Kasenova, a senior fellow and director of the program on Central Asia at Harvard University, who's going to talk about the implications of the war for Central Asia. Uh, each of our panelists will talk for uh, between five and 10 minutes, and then we'll have some time left for uh, discussion. For uh, questions, uh, you'll see on the event webpage, a green button that says ask live questions here. So if you want to ask a question, please click on that uh, and type your question uh, in the chat box. So without any further ado, uh, let me turn the floor over to Professor Liesl Hintz. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Thank you for organizing this fantastic event. And I think very importantly, um, highlighting these the, these countries and the effects that we're seeing in them. Um, I'll focus my opening comments more on sort of the, the geopolitical and security um, sort of uh, implications for Turkey, both its effects on Turkey and uh, the role that Turkey seeks to play um, in the regional space. But I also just want to briefly highlight uh, the economic consequences for Turkey. Um, Turkey already was going through and is going through, has been going through a very severe economic crisis, um, currency crisis. Uh, inflation was 61.1% last month. Um, so we have a lot of very tangible, everyday, on the ground consequences for the Turkish people that have been severely exacerbated um, by energy price hikes that are related to the war, um, that are related to transport of food, um, that are related to a number of, of issues that are resulting from this conflict. And so I think that sort of everyday on the ground um, set of implications is really important. But when it comes to sort of the bigger picture, um, you know, Turkey finds itself in a very complicated and, and sort of, um, it finds itself in a very complicated situation, but one in which they've been able, I think, strategically to take advantage of. Turkey obviously is a NATO member um, and it shares maritime borders with Russia and Ukraine. Um, so that already complicates its situation. But if you look at the relationship between both Turkey and Russia and Turkey and Ukraine prior to Russia's invasion, you get a sense of how complicated this relationship is. And there's lots of metaphors of Turkey sort of being caught in the middle and potentially fence sitting and, and you know, trying to play both sides. And so I think we have to get a sense of what that relationship looked like. You know, you have a NATO member who's purchased an S-400 missile defense system from Russia. Um, and so that obviously has exacerbated tensions with NATO, with the U.S. in particular. That's had severe consequences um, for Turkey, although it's also opened up a space for defense production. Um, and that has a lot to do with Turkey's relationship with Ukraine as well. So Turkey has defense contracts with Ukraine. It's obviously been selling its TB2 Bayraktar drones to Ukraine, which everybody's talking about. People are making 
music videos about it. Um, there are a lot of concerns about how the drones have been used and the civilian casualties they've produced um, in Syria and other arenas. Um, Turkey even signed a defense cooperation agreement with Ukraine to produce uh, the Bayraktar drones there. So that's an element. Um, on the Russia side, uh, you have uh, again, the, the defense cooperation or the security cooperation over the S-400s. Um, you have energy cooperation with the Turk Stream pipeline that opened in 2020. You have Russian investment, Russian tourism, uh, Turkish exports to Russia, construction ties, and security ties. And a lot of that has to do with Turkey's uh, military activities in northern Syria and Russian control of the airspace there. We also don't necessarily know all of the ties between Turkey and Russia and all of the potential leverage that Putin specifically may have over Erdogan, his family, and his close circles. So Turkey does find itself in a very you know, tight, constrained position in terms of sort of trying to play both sides. Although I do think this has provided, perhaps this is a crass understanding of it, but an opportunity for Turkey to leverage its geopolitical position, its role, its ties with both sides, and its ability to sort of market itself or present itself and raise its international status in terms of key regional player because Turkey sort of needs to be taken seriously um, in terms of what the dynamics for this conflict are. Turkey has, of course, sort of uh, facilitated talks between the Russian and Ukrainian foreign minister on the sidelines of the Anatolia Diplomacy Forum. Um, Turkey hosted peace talks in Istanbul. Uh, Turkey did not close its airspace to Russia. Turkey did not engage in sanctions in Russia, although it did highly condemn the invasion. So there's a lot of sort of maneuvering and, and calculation that I think that the Turkish government is engaging in to avoid taking sides, to be able to play the mediator role. And that mediator role is really important because it means Turkey by definition can't take a side. And I think that's a very beneficial for Tur very beneficial position for Turkey to be in. When you see all of the different diplomatic talks um, that happened over the past couple of weeks with the Greek prime minister, with Israel, um, we're looking towards uh, a visit by Erdogan to Saudi. There's a clear attempt to try to raise Turkey's profile, to communicate to the international audience that Turkey must be taken seriously, that it has a lot to contribute, um, and that its its status should be reckoned with in a sense. And I think a lot of that can be understood as a pushback against uh, sort of the U.S.'s attempts to try to uh, constrain Turkey, to curtail, to curtail Turkey's defense purchases, its objections against the S-400, all of that. So again, you know, Turkey has this complex set of ties even prior to Russia's invasion. Um, and then you have the ways in which Turkey is able to sort of use this opportunity to criticize NATO for not doing enough, but also not being the country that is able to step in and contribute militarily because it's trying to play this mediator role or this sort of facilitator of peace talks. So I think it's both a, a very challenging position for Turkey to be in, but I think it's also an opportunity. And, and this gets a little bit out of the region of study, but I think an opportunity to ameliorate a lot of the ties that Turkey has uh, has exacerbated, has has created tensions within, um, with the U.S., with uh, some European states, um, and with countries in the Gulf and elsewhere. So in this sense, it's Erdogan's almost history of turning a crisis into an opportunity, both abroad and then domestically, being able to, in a sense, blame some of the economic crisis he's seeing on the effects from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Okay, great. Thank you for that very comprehensive overview. Um, I know we'll come back to a lot of that in the in the Q and A, but now um, let me go over to Alessia. I will speak about South Caucasus, which is a region uh, of three countries: Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, but also three breakaway regions: Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, the Ukraine war has been something that may, um, I mean, in the societies, they uh, were mainly kind of trying to associate themselves, mainly because uh, Georgia went through its own history of the wars. Um, Armenia, Azerbaijan, just uh, a year and a half ago, they also had their war. And I think at the public level, there is this kind of, you know, emotional um, um, 
I would say, a response, you know, to, to what, everything that is happening in Ukraine. Um, when it comes to the leaderships and the, uh, to the governments, um, look, I mean, with, uh, with uh, countries, they measure borders, but not necessarily they share the views and uh, often they look in different directions. And uh, what has been happening, especially since the beginning of this war, is uh, with, uh, an increased anxiety about uh, um, about this prospect that at some point uh, they will have to make a choice which camp to join. And uh, while uh, some of these countries, they are already part of, uh, of like, either they are closer to the NATO and the European Union, I'm talking about uh, Georgia, um, or Armenia is uh, associated with uh, Russian allied uh, security alliance and also part of the Eurasian uh, economic union. Um, and and uh, Azerbaijan has traditionally tried to kind of keep its own kind of non-aligned position, mainly because it, it has this privilege of because it's the richest country uh, in the South Caucasus with the biggest population. But I mean, this is now the time and can, when you speak to the officials, you understand that they are worried that this is a time when they will have eventually to, to make a choice. And uh, we already started seeing some of the kind of preparations or like a pushback uh, related to that. Like for example, Georgia, it was yesterday that the Georgian foreign minister here received the questionnaire that uh, potentially should uh, help the country to get closer to the European Union. Um, when it comes to Armenia, you can see a lot of a lot of um, kind of you know moves uh, taken in order to still sustain some contacts uh, with the Western countries while keeping, of course, uh, uh, the the line with uh, with Russia, which is uh, still the main um, economic, political, and security uh, partner. And then when it comes to Azerbaijan, uh, we we see that Azerbaijan also kind of tries to navigate uh, uh, in that sense. Azerbaijan just a day before the war started. It uh, was the country that um, uh, which was Azerbaijani president that was in Kremlin and they kind of sealed um, with uh, strategic uh, agreement, a new one, um, something that Armenia <laughs> potentially will have to do as well. Um, so, I mean, this kind of expectation that something big is to happen, it is here and it also, it, it certainly does not really kind of contribute uh, to this uh, whole feeling that uh, kind of over stability, I would say, or something that where people will see as a uh, incentive to um, to to keep uh, the situation calm in a way. And then uh, when it comes to that, uh, um, there are quite quite a lot of people uh, who are talking about the South Caucasus as the best possible place of the Second Front for Russia. Um, and in that sense, I mean, people either speak about Georgia. Um, and uh, in the relation to the Russian military presence, presence and occupation in South Ossetia or Abkhazia, or they are talking about Nagorno-Karabakh, where which is uh, I think is kind of a bit kind of you know misleading because uh, the Russian presence there it's still kind of a very small one, is uh, around 1,600 people right now, and they are very lightly armed, so it's kind of you know it's it's a very different presence if to compare it to Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but. Um, we already started seeing some certain consequences. Um, uh, I mean, related to that, like for example, we had uh, Azerbaijani troops for the first time since the 2020 war uh, penetrating um, uh, the front line and taking over a uh, very strategic mountainous um, place. And uh, I would say that there are some other places like this, you know, along the front line. So there is kind of uh, you know, with uh, some, especially the locals, they are working that uh, the longer the Ukraine war lasts, uh, the more there will be a temptation um, to test basically, you know, the situation on the ground and certainly without uh, the um, without uh, the support from outside the Nagorno-Karabakh forces, they will not be really able to uh, to show a response and, uh, and, and the, that um, <laughs> that outside support, it's not necessarily Armenian one, which is what I'm trying to say. So, um, and then when it comes to Georgia, I mean, you probably heard that we had some very interesting developments recently in terms of the um, de facto leadership uh, of South Ossetia announcing that they will call for the referendum. And that was a huge surprise, not just uh, to those who, uh, who are kind of watching from outside, but also here to people on the ground, mainly because, I mean, uh, it's, uh, you don't really see much of the incentive to go for such a referendum. Um, everything is more than 
come, uh, the Georgian leadership did not uh, kind of, you know, did not introduce any special sanctions, has made everything possible to comfort uh, Moscow, you know, showing that they are not posing any kind of threat to the point that the Russian um, Russian military were able to take some of their, um, at least some of their personnel and also tanks and other heavy weaponry from Abkhazia and South Ossetia and drive them to Ukraine. I mean, uh, you can understand the level of the confidence there that Georgia is not definitely not doing anything anytime soon. And the, at the same time, I mean, inside South Ossetia, there were little kind of uh, um, little reason to call for any kind of referendum because the breakover region has been allied with Russia for such a long time. Uh, and uh, if there is a call for the annexation, it's kind of, you know, it's uh, just a formality that will be there. So many kind of see it as another, uh, another consequence, early consequence of the uh, Ukraine crisis. And I will very shortly say, I mean, in terms of like of what to do, um, you know, on the one hand, what I'm describing is kind of emotions, uh, people getting scared, anxiety, some uh, some some developments are already taking place in the in the region. But on the other hand, when you speak to the officials on the ground, and I'm talking about those in um, not just in the capitals uh, that are directly concerned, but also in, for example, in break regions. What's interesting is when you speak to them, you understand uh, how little is the appetite to uh, become part of these kind of uh, bigger schemes and, and bigger um, problems that can come to the region. Uh, you can see very cooperative uh, um, uh, officials, for example, in de facto entities who want to keep the channels open, who are going to uh, to some of these kind of official forms to negotiate situation on the ground. Uh, you see that they are <laughs> continuously kind of opening the channels open for this very reason. You know, they want to uh, to avoid. Um, at least kind of, you know, some small incident that can become something, a, a bigger problem. And then, uh, and on the other hand, you can also see, for example, Armenian and Azerbaijani leaders traveling to Brussels just to have a chat about what just happened in Nagorno-Karabakh and to find a way to avoid um, expansion of the uh, tensions. Can this uh, kind of, can this uh, sort of communication be a guarantee? Definitely not. But at least I think uh, it's really very important and very positive that there are, um, they are taking an attempt uh, to keep the channels open, to continue communication, and it will be very, very important to um, to have uh, external actors also to contribute to support uh, you know, this kind of communication through sustaining uh, at least these form formats, you know, negotiation formats that. <laughs> Some of them haven't been receiving, uh, they haven't been really producing much of the result in recent years. But right now, they are, uh, this is the time to make use of them, at least to kind of to prevent uh, um, some, some of the incidents that can become something bigger um, and uh, uh, for, for bad for this region, for this part of the world. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Alessia. Um, let's go now to our final panelist, uh, Nargis. Thank, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, what we're seeing today is the um, continuing dissolution of the Soviet Union, and we all thought it was a, a peaceful divorce. But now we see that you know one party at least couldn't uh, couldn't process it, um, and that's what I want to start my remarks uh, on Central Asia. So at the time of the collapses, uh, many of us remember. Uh, Central Asian republics were the ones who were most willing to stick with Russia, to remain in, inside, the, uh, inside the Union, and uh, they were least wanted by Russia, with the exception of uh, Kazakhstan. And over the, past, uh, over the past three decades, while having their grievances, concerns, fears of Russia, they continue to stick with it, and uh, particularly Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Uh, as we know, these three um, Central Asian states are members of the uh, collective security treaty organization. Also, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are members of the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan uh, have had special arrangements with uh, uh, with Russia. Uzbekistan exactly a year ago signed a, a five-year plan of military cooperation um, under the umbrella of the strategic partnership uh, partnership with Russia. Uh, and um, all five have treated Russia as the top dog in the neighborhood. 
softly balancing it with the uh, by carrying out multi-vector uh, foreign policies. And Russia has provided uh, political patronage uh, and security, also not in a full-fledged uh, full-fledged way. Uh, so, for example, in the 90s, Uzbeks felt that uh, Russia is not providing enough support uh, um, with dealing with the Afghanistan threat, and that's why they suspended their m- membership in the Collective Security Treaty Organization at the end of the uh, 90s, uh, then rejoined and suspended again. Um, we remember the 2010 uh, inter-ethnic clashes in southern Kyrgyzstan in Osh when the interim government of Kyrgyzstan appealed for uh, CSTO help and uh, didn't uh, didn't get this help. Uh, and then there was the CSTO operation in Kazakhstan earlier this year, uh, which I think is a very special case and we can return to that if we want in the, uh, in the Q&A. And uh, while from time to time Mo- Moscow was concerned, uh, that other powers, especially the West, are trying to gain positions in the region at the expense of uh, uh, of Russia. This fear subsided uh, with time, uh, and uh, this sort of the dominant view was that uh, Central Asia has nowhere to go. Uh, and in fact, uh, unlike Ukraine or Georgia, uh, geopolitically we could not escape to uh, to Europe. Uh, China is an option, but uh, as Russians rightly conceded, that wouldn't be a preferred option for uh, for Central Asians. And here I want to underscore uh, one feature. Um, Central Asian governments have many shortcomings, uh, but they have approached and managed relations with Russia in a very careful way, I would say. Uh, and uh, the overall, their foreign policy have, uh, has been quite uh, quite prudent. Uh, and this gives me some hope that uh, maybe the region can meddle through uh, this major cri- crisis we have uh, on our hands now. Um, I think there is a realist understanding in Central Asian capitals uh, that we, we are to a large extent on our own. Um, as uh, Kazakhstan's President Kasim Jumar Tokayev uh, mentioned, noted in his uh, latest address, uh, address to the people, uh, nobody cares about con- our country but us. Uh, and uh, there is understanding that it's important to maintain uh, the the uh, well, multi-vector foreign policies and these multiple partnerships with different actors with great powers. Uh, but if something happens, um, uh, well, for example, something happens in northern Kazakhstan, right? Uh, we probably cannot count on the same level of support as uh, neighbors of the EU, and uh, and also um, the, there is not much leverage left, right? Uh, what what uh, what what tools can the EU, uh, the EU, the West, the uh, US? Uh, use now vis-a-vis Russia. Uh, there isn't much. Uh, so uh, that said, uh, I personally think that uh, this scenario is highly unlikely. But we are now in the, t- you know, in the kind of territory, in the uncharted territory, things that were unthinkable before. So, you know, <laughs> now we're dealing with that. So. Um, another scenario: if Russia weakens its security uh, security support. Um, given its concentration on the war in uh, Ukraine, uh, with Ukraine and uh, whatever term um, is correct to describe what's happening with the Russian economy now, uh, then um, it can also prove to me to be manageable. Uh, We'll see other international actors um, might increase their support uh, to uh, Central Asian states in dealing with the Afghanistan challenge. I also hope very much that uh, the governments of the region will be even more careful man- managing relations with each other. And here I would focus first and foremost on Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, because they had uh, they had a number of uh, border flare ups in the recent past. Um, and luckily, and thanks to this prudence that is res- that, that that results from this kind of sense of vulnerability, uh, we. Uh, have not had a m- big interstate conflict over disputed borders, enclaves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think there is a difference with the uh, uh, with South Caucasus in this regard. Um, so 
so I think the kind of uh, it's a very very difficult uh, difficult period, and I'm I haven't mentioned the economic problems problems. Uh, uh, we have little mentioned the the economic economic troubles that Turkey will be experiencing. For Central Asia, it's even you know more severe. The implications are more severe, and the impact. Uh, but I, I kind of remain very cautiously optimistic that we might actually uh, survive uh, survive this uh, uh, ordeal. All right, that's a pretty sobering note uh, to end on. Um, thank you all. Um, let me just uh, pose a question or two to, to all of you, and then we'll go to the questions that we've received from the audience. Uh, and again, a reminder to those of you who uh, are joining us online, if you have questions, uh, please click on the green button on the event webpage where it says Ask Live Questions here. Uh, and type your questions uh, in the box that appears, and uh, they will get sent to us through the magic of the internet. Um, okay, let me start um, by posing a question to, to all of you, um, and that is about how uh, the conflict is being perceived domestically uh, in each of the countries and regions that, that we've spoken about. Um, Alessia, I was uh, recently in Georgia and was quite taken by uh, the very visible support for Ukraine. Uh, in, in Tbilisi. The number of people with Ukrainian flags and the, the pro-Ukraine graffiti uh, was, was very noticeable. Uh, and you mentioned how the government has been very cautious and is trying kind of to, to keep its head down. So I wonder what you thought about how um, public opinion and, and this divide between where the government seems to be and where the public seems to be uh, is going to shape not just the response in Georgia, but in, in the other countries in the region as well. And I'd pose a similar question to Liesl and, and to Nargis. Um, you know, how does public opinion in Turkey and then in the Central Asian countries look at the conflict and how does that public opinion shape the, the calculations of the governments? So I will probably just start. Um, uh, in Georgia, um, it was a very interesting process. I mean, especially during the first week of the war, um, many associate Georgia with uh, what, what's happening in Ukraine. You can often uh, hear people saying that it's like 2008 uh, when Russia invaded Georgia. And, and I should say that many of the, kind of the pictures, many of the videos uh, that I am also watching, I mean, they very much resemble what I saw in 2008 in South Ossetia and in, in, in the areas nearby. So, I mean, uh, that with with uh, whole sentiment and support uh, to Ukraine, I think it's very much very unprecedented. I have never seen anything like this, and I've been living here for more than half of my life. And uh, you can see people donating their salaries, uh, sending. I mean, they are donating their blood, <laughs> you know. And so it's uh, it's. Uh, it's uh, lots of lots of solidarity there in the society. And in the beginning, when the government, when the leadership basically started taking this careful, um, you know, stance or what what you call like uh, keeping their heads down. Uh, of course, there were people who didn't like it, and even more uh, who believed that this is definitely not the time to do things like this, uh, because I mean, uh, it's uh, in a way like a turning point. And look, I mean, Georgia in its uh, over 30 years of its independence, you know, it has gone through these turning points. Uh, that kind of, you know, uh, that predicted its uh, recent uh, modern history. It's like 9 of April, for example, in 1989, you know, with the dispersal of the action, uh, of the protest. And um, I mean, the, the that that was definitely not understood <laughs> by many in the in the public. And um, uh, and then the protest uh, uh, that uh, that we saw uh, as a result of that, they uh, you. They, they first they were the biggest in many years. Uh, we haven't seen, for example, in the position, you know, like uh, uh, being able to bring so many people uh, in the streets. But on the other, you could see lots of lots of people who are traditionally associated with the uh, ruling party who were protesting as well. So why I'm saying that is, this is something that the um, the Georgian leadership cannot uh, ignore. And uh, you cannot just pretend that you do not live in this country. These are your relatives, uh, these are your friends, and uh, you still walk in the streets. So, um, and, and I think the Georgian government, they are still very, very careful. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I mean, it's clear that uh, uh, they 
they follow the they they understand the call coming from the public and um, and you can see that even bureaucracy how much you know the bureaucracy is doing uh, in, in so that kind of we support is in place and uh, and I, and everyone kind of gets a message <laughs> that uh, the Georgian public is with Ukraine and I should say that inside Abkhazia and South Ossetia is definitely is it's very opposite mm, so people there on the ground they uh, on the one hand of course you can still see people um, even doing they they are kind of you know they are making public statements and uh, posting in the social media they are also going to the traditional media and they say that we don't think that this is something that we should be associated with also Russia is our strategic partner but on the other hand of course um, people who live in these breakaway regions they kind of consider with uh, that resembles very much uh, what they had to go through either in the beginning of the 90s or in 2008. And, uh, and and I think this is a, another reason why you can still kind of see people there who are kind of 100% uh, um, supporting Russian invasion uh, in Ukraine. But I mean, uh, you cannot really say that. <laughs> this is just like, uh, uh, with are all the people uh, in these break regions. Well, in Armenia, it's very, very divided. And uh, uh, Armenia has extremely small um, space for maneuver after the 2020 war. It has become even more dependent on Russia than it was before that. And uh, and the society is extremely traumatized from the brutal war um, that uh, took place a year and a half. And uh, of course, many think about like, uh, what's next? What is the way out? What is the alternative? And in that sense, uh, certainly the alternative is something that uh, that comes uh, from the West and also comes from more cooperation with the neighbors and with neighbors are sometimes considered the enemies, which are um, Azerbaijan and Turkey. And uh, because of that, you can see um, the local nationalists and also some opposition groups coming together and protesting against uh, something that hasn't even happened yet. Um, in terms of like a building context, building links uh, with those who are considered traditional enemies. And in Azerbaijan, uh, this is a really kind of very, um, it, it has very distinct place, I would say. And uh, on the one hand, you can see a lot of people who are kind of continuously protesting the Russian military, um, r the presence of the Russian peacekeepers in Nagorno-Karabakh. And of course, in that sense, well, what's happening in Ukraine is kind of, um, it's, uh, it's uh, it can be seen by some as an opportunity, you know, reinforcing the position of uh, let's push them out. But on the other also kind of uh, um, that a fear that if we uh, if we deepen if we do something wrong, you know there can be the consequences for the country. Um, but uh, I mean, Azerbaijan is probably one of the most stable, mainly because uh, it is considered uh, by the West and, and European Union has already um, made this commitment of uh, uh, making use of its uh, natural gas and oil products um, as an alternative to Russia. So I mean, I would say that among these three uh, in the South Caucasus, Azerbaijan is probably in the in the best uh, position place and uh, and the society uh, while being critical to uh, um, you you can see that some critical voices again against Russia it's very much still in the hands of the leadership on how how it will it will be developing uh, inside the country okay thank you um Lizelle why don't I pass it to you yeah, I can pick up on that. And I apologize, my internet connection is is being a little uh, little odd. Um, and I, I recognize that I have the luxury of only having to sum up one country's response. Um, although within con within that country, um, there's a, a variety of, of responses. Obviously, Turkey is a different case. It's not part of the former Soviet Union. Um, it has its own current uh, sort of neo-imperial uh, imperial revivalist uh, ambitions, or at least had until uh, several years ago, I would say. Um, but in terms of the attitudes towards this, you know, you don't have uh, a very strong um, anti-Russia sentiment within Turkey. Um, you don't have very strong pro-Russian sentiment in Turkey, although with the far left, um, you've seen some really interesting and amongst the center left itself, there have been some really fascinating divides of what is going on with the far left that they are, you know, sort of um, almost showing solidarity with Moscow um, in this, which I think has been really 
uh, a moment to reckon with, I think, with uh, with the center left in Turkey. What is the, the super far left doing? Um, in terms of um, sort of previous ethnic ties, one of the elements to recognize within Turkey is that you have had a sort of pan-Turkic nationalist movement within Turkey that's part of the, the right and the far right in Turkey. And that is the, the group that would have had the most anti-Russian sentiments, that would have seen Russia as the oppressor of Turkic populations. Um, and in fact, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, you had attempts to kind of build a pan-Turkic union or to try to unite Turkic populations um, that had been under the Soviet yoke, uh, you know, either through economic ties or, or cultural ties or political ties. But it turns out that a lot of, you know, understandably Turkic populations weren't looking for a new big brother uh, right after the, the collapse of Soviet Union. They weren't looking for another uh, country to sort of dictate their their policies to them or tell them what identity they were. Uh, and so and Turkic sentiment in Turkey, which, for example, was very um, vociferously against the Russian invasion of Crimea, for example, the annexation of Crimea. Um, that was also, it's, and it's worth considering this other case as well, it was also very, very vocal about the Uyghurs in that criticism, both of Russia's annexation of Crimea and the effect on the Turkic Tatar population there and of uh, the treatment of Uyghurs in China has been, I don't want to say necessarily silenced entirely, but has contracted a bit given Turkey's energy and economic ties with Russia and given Turkey's ties with China. And so it's interesting to kind of see how those geopolitical uh, implications and relationships uh, and energy and economic needs are sort of trumping those identity ties in some in some ways. In terms of the pro-Ukrainian um, uh, solidarity and sentiment, you do see that within Turkey. It's not the number one agenda item, I would say. Um, you do see some displays of solidarity waving Ukrainian flags, um, but also sort of those protests are framed around the Bayraktar drones. And so there's a sense that this is really almost Turkey's moment to shine in terms of its military contribution of its domestic defense industry. And so while there are shows of solidarity with the Ukrainian people, the some of the messaging seems to be more about, again, as I sort of intimated earlier, how important a role Turkey is playing in terms of being the provider of those drones to Ukraine, in terms of being, you know, Um, okay, I think uh, we lost Liesl here, so um, while she tries to reconnect, maybe, uh, Nargis, we can pass this over to you. Oh, I think Liesl's... Oh, no. Um, well, there is, a, uh, there is a variation in Central Asia as well, and um, I would say um, the public in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan is the most engaged on the issue, and Kyrgyzstan, of course, has the very vibrant uh, civil society, so uh, they, they, are, they are vocal. Um, and in, in Kazakhstan, there is this kind of uh, uh, budding civil society, uh, and uh, the, uh, there is a small Ukrainian community, uh, which used to be bigger. Um, there are some special affinities um, I think that that Kazakhstan is filled with uh, with uh, with Ukraine, and just uh, to give you one uh, one kind of uh, example, uh, one illustration is the uh, the fact that uh, when um, the city the, the streets in the city of Almaty were renamed in the 90s. Um, um, and, or, you know, kind of the, the Lenin Avenue was gone and, you know, Karl Marx and uh, <laughs> all those uh, were renamed. Uh, um, the two streets retained the, the, the names. Uh, uh, well, actually, let's say three. Uh, so Pushkin Street uh, retained the name, but also Gogol and Shevchenko. And these are very central, <laughs> central streets uh, in, in the city. So, uh, and uh, we also had the kind of this shared, uh, um, uh, shared path of uh, denuclearization with Ukraine. So, so th th there are these connections and kind of, and also, you know, kind of similarities uh, 
in a sense of the disputed uh, kind of disputed uh, <laughs> territories of other northern Kazakhstan there uh, well Crimea and 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 and, and so on um, uh, so the reaction was stronger in um, in, in these two, uh, and the societies got divided. There were those who live in the Russian uh, information space, and and overall, as already mentioned, kind of Central Asia is generally kind of quite Russia friendly, right? Um, um, so th there are people who watch Russian TV, and Russian TV is toxic, you know, and you know it's very good that. Kind of forming this uh, worldview in people's uh, people's heads that is very difficult to challenge with facts or with you know anything basically, um, uh, and there are those who who get information from other sources and uh, who um, uh, well uh, are very concerned and against the war in, uh, in Russia's invasion of Ukraine because. Uh, because what they see, you know, the, the, the atrocities they see, so it's sort of on the uh, on the human rights uh, gro grounds, uh, but also um, the nation building, uh, of course, uh, uh, project, uh, you know, has been underway for 30 years and didn't start from scratch uh, in 1991. So people feel that, you know, kind of uh, the question of sovereignty is an important one. Territorial integrity is important, and uh, and Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity was violated, and we are in the same kind of in the same position. If their sovereignty is not recognized, you know, uh, why our, our sovereignty would be recognized and respected uh, respected by Russia? Um, so so the, the the public is divided. Those who are against the war, they've been uh, they've been very active. Uh, they've been um, um, uh, collecting humanitarian aid, uh, so already several planes full of humanitarian aid were sent to uh, sent to Ukraine, um, and <clears throat> there are <clears throat> art fairs and concerts and and so on and so forth to collect collect the money, uh, and there was a uh, there was a rally. Um, Against the war that took place uh, in the city of Almaty, and uh, and it gathered more people than you know um, where, than we had for the longest time. So three thousand people gathered. Um, um, so and the, there are protests in Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan as well. It's it's a kind of it's divisive issue. Crimea was divisive, but uh, the the, uh, the ongoing war is even even more so. You know, uh, family split over <laughs> over the issue. You know, those who watch TV and those who don't watch the TV, basically. So, um, yeah, let me let me stop here. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the questions that we've received from uh, the audience. Um, so let me start. Uh, these are questions um, specifically directed to Liesel. Um, so one uh, is about Turkey's role as an energy transit state. Uh, how will the conflict uh, impact Turkey's energy ambitions? Uh, will it increase uh, Turkey's leverage with the EU? Um, another person asks about the potential for uh, a currency, sovereign debt, or banking crisis in Turkey, uh, whether the war is making that more likely and what the implications would be uh, were any of those to happen. Thanks, and sorry for cutting out there. And I guess thanks for uh, picking up where I was uh, unable to continue. So two really good questions. Um, I think in terms of the energy side of this, Turkey has had aspirations to become um, an energy transport center uh, for quite a while. It's had a number of different pipeline projects that it's been a part of. Um, it's up and down relations with Russia have uh, shaped that. It's up and down relations with Israel, with Iran uh, have shaped that. Uh, Turkey obviously is, uh, is dependent on external sources for energy um, and Russia and Iran are two big providers of that. So its regional politics are deeply tied with its energy politics. Um, you know, the opening of Turkish of Turk Stream in 2020, um, delivering the first uh, gas flows to Bulgaria, I think, was lauded as a, as a success of Turkish-Russia partnership um, that was happening at the same time as this other, you know, security cooperation and, and defense production and, and all that other, uh, all those other sides of, um, of the relationship as well. I think that this 
uh, conflict is having Turkey have to kind of, as other countries are, rethink its dependence on Russia, rethink how it can diversify its energy. Um, and I think that the attempted rapprochement that you're seeing with Israel uh, and the fact that Turkey continually tries to place the issue of a joint pipeline with Israel on the agenda in all of its talks. And every time it mentions Israel, that's the sort of main focus that it is uh, trying to, to place emphasis on. So I think energy politics is a, is a really big part of this. Um, I think this is shaping Turkey's uh, rapprochement with a lot of countries. I think, you know, up until relatively recently, Turkey had become quite regionally isolated and its only real allies in the region was, was Qatar and, and the Libyan GNA. Um, and so I think that um, its aggression in the Eastern Mediterranean, its oil exploration um, in Greek uh, designated territorial waters uh, have raised the, the level of tensions with a number of countries. And so I think this is a repositioning of Turkey trying to become less dependent on, on Russian energy, be uh, a key player in regional energy politics um, and try to use this opportunity to, again, ameliorate some of those relations. And I think that comes to the, the financial crisis question, um, the debt crisis, the currency crisis, the crisis of confidence in the government, all kinds of different uh, forms of crisis that are happening in Turkey right now, which, and maybe this uh, got cut off, but I, I was mentioning that this, uh, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine is not at the top of, of what a lot of people are talking about in Turkey. And they're talking about economic crisis and, and price hikes and energy crisis and, and um, food prices. And again, 61.1% inflation last month. Um, and so I think that, you know, there has been an attempt by the Turkish government to try to spend its way out of this, to really, you know, push for growth at the expense of inflation. And there is an extent to which uh, you can't use fancy techniques to stabilize the lira, that you can't use hot money to keep the economy going. And I think, uh, although I would acknowledge that we've been saying this since 2016, I think we're nearing um, some kind of economic crisis and uh, that that you know, really manifests itself in a different way than we've seen so far. And of course, that's relevant because we have elections scheduled for next year and the ruling party is doing all it can, all it can to try to shore up support amongst voters, um, raising minimum wage. But as soon as they do that, inflation has surpassed it. So it's it's a mess of issues that we should keep following. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, let's move on to uh, the next question. Uh, this one is for Alessia, um, and it's about how the relationship between Armenia and Russia uh, has changed, uh, especially since um, the, the uh, second Nagorno-Karabakh war. Um, and I would add, uh, on top of this, uh, what impact does the war in Ukraine have on uh, this sort of nascent push for normalization uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan and ultimately Armenia and Turkey? Um, so when it comes to uh, Russia, I think I mentioned before that uh, in the 2020 war in Nagorno-Karabakh left Armenia even more dependent on Russia. And uh, in addition to the Russian uh, military uh, military base in Gyumri, um, that has been there since the Soviet times, we got uh, also additional uh, Russian presence uh, in a number of places along Armenia-Azerbaijan border. Uh, Russia has become the, um, for quite sometime before the European Union started also testing borders. Um, like it was uh, the sole mediator between Baku and Yerevan. And uh, Russia basically was the only one uh, proposing different things that, that are, uh, of course, in the interest of Armenia to stabilize the situation on the ground, because uh, Armenia does not really have uh, um, much resource to continue fighting and to continue confrontation. So with this, uh, with this something that was uh, coming from Russia, um, also, uh, that was a uh, Russian initiative uh, to start looking into a possibilities of reconnecting the region. Uh, you probably know that for 30 years, the borders with uh, um, Azerbaijan and Turkey for Armenia, they were closed and the country has been and de facto um, the U.S. embargo, you know, by from these countries. and. Um, 
And um, yeah, I mean, with uh, with something that Russia started uh, helping after the 2020 war, which uh, created an additional layer of uh, dependence slash opportunity, you know, in that sense. And um, having said that, I should say that probably that uh, um, when you speak to the Russian officials, which I did uh, quite. Um, quite a lot, you know, before uh, before we uh, you know, war in Ukraine, um, you understand that uh, the vision that Moscow has been having for the South Caucasus, it was more about uh, helping um, the countries, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, and also kind of in a broader region that would kind of bring in others uh, next to them. Um, to reconnect and to start kind of communicating with each other. And I think uh, with, this, uh, with this where um, this kind of grand idea uh, uh, that has been in Kremlin, it is still in place. Um, so you, on the one hand, uh, you can see, for example, the other day, uh, Russian foreign minister, he was criticizing the U.S. and France for facilitating, you know, some kind of uh, some processes that do not uh, in necessarily include the Russian officials. And he was talking about the meeting in Brussels, but uh, it took uh, quite little for Moscow to regain its confidence in the process that is, in fact, in, in the interest of Moscow, because Moscow does not want the second front and Moscow will be the first to profit from the peaceful situation uh, in the South Caucasus and from um, more the connection and more kind of contacts uh, uh, there uh, in the South Caucasus, uh, while especially the war in Ukraine is uh, still ongoing. Uh, before the 2020, uh, before the war in uh, Ukraine, we saw some uh, contacts taking place uh, between uh, special envoys uh, of Turkey and Armenia. It's uh, um, they met um, twice, once in Moscow. The other time it was in Vienna. Shortly, um, um, I mean, when. Some time ago, we also had the first uh, visit of the Armenian foreign minister to Turkey. He took part in the Antalya Forum, um, and that was the first visit in a, in a over a decade. So that was really kind of symbolically important in that sense. Where does this process lead? It's too early to say. Um, in Yerevan, they have great hopes, uh, mainly because um, uh, Opening the border with Turkey would uh, grant the country a lot of economic relief. Uh, and uh, especially in this current situation, when Russia is getting sanctioned and there is kind of little, little uh, certainty about like what, 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 what is going to happen to the kind of broader region. And again, uh, Armenia is part of Russia-led economic Eurasian Union. So in, in that sense, of course, for Armenia, getting an alternative, starting getting an alternative is something that could be of interest, but um, we also see that Turkey is not in a rush. Um, on the one hand, uh, some Turkish officials say that it's kind of a relict of the past and that the border should be open, uh, you know, and their relations, uh, they should establish the relations, but on the other hand, um, they, they kind of continue watching, <laughs> you know, how, how, it, how it goes. And certainly, I mean, uh, Turkey the, is not that much dependent <laughs> on that border, which is mainly Armenia. So, I mean, um, we haven't seen uh, the meetings of the special envoys since the beginning of the war. Um, before the war, there were some concerns in Ankara that, um, I mean, that Russia was, Russia, in fact, was very supportive. Uh, you know, Russia even hosted the first meeting um, in Moscow, uh, but uh, uh, how it goes and uh, where it leads, I think it's kind of a part of a um, broader considerations that are in Turkey mainly, and then that uh, um, even before the war again, I mean, uh, in Ankara, kind of they were not in a rush of kind of uh, taking some concrete steps and uh, the war, I think it's not something that will uh, make them, you know, to uh, to take the steps um, either. So, I mean, if it happens, it happens. And <laughs> um, and um, I hope that it will happen because it's in, in general, it's very, very important for the region and uh, to start kind of uh, finding the ways to build relationships, no matter whether with this to start, with this to happen through open the border or kind of some smaller steps that can contribute to the uh, more uh, more relations there yeah okay great 
We're running a little low on time, so um, we've got one more question, and this one I'll open up to everybody. Um, and it's about the economic impact uh, of the conflict. So the questioner asks, uh, especially about uh, the impact on grain exports from Russia and Ukraine, um, what that would mean for the economic stability of each of the countries and regions that we've been talking about. Um, and at the same time, whether there are economic opportunities uh, that may result uh, as a result of the the, the cutoff of uh, or the reduction in uh, grain or other exports from from Russia and Ukraine. So let's go around and uh, let each of our panelists answer this question. Uh, Nargis, why don't we start with you? Um, I, I don't have special expertise on uh, grain grain uh, exports uh, and agricultural uh, export imports, but uh, um, but we do import. Uh, uh, grain from Russia, um, and um, and at, at a certain point, Russia imposed a ban on export to uh, even to member states of the Eurasian Economic Union, which created a lot of you know anxiety. Uh, then uh, this ban was uh, lifted. Um, uh, so I, I I don't think we are in a situation that is as bad as uh, the countries of the. Middle East, and you know that are you know uh, really uh, severely uh, dependent. And uh, well, Kazakhstan is a producer of grain. It was just we were importing our kind of high quality, exporting our high quality grain and importing uh, some somewhat lower quality Russian Russian grain. Um, so well, yeah, we're in a somewhat uh, better situation because you know the transportation routes are also not not interrupted, right? Uh, the uh, we can we can do it uh, we can do it uh, directly. Uh, in terms of economic opportunities, that's 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 actually a big area of discussion at the moment uh, in in Central Asia. Uh, what opportunities do arise from from the situation now that uh, you know businesses exit Russia? Do they want to if they want to stay in the region? Maybe Central Asia is the place. You know, uh, there are you know tens of thousands of Russians who fled to nearby to the near abroad. You know, something unthinkable before. So we have you know lots of IT specialists, Russian business people in the cities of Central Asia now. Um, so kind of uh, well uzbekistan and you know kazakhstan also are hoping to kind of improve the it sector you know with the help of the russian uh, russian experts i know armenia is quite big in this regard uh, um uh, and the you know and overall if we maintain these links uh, this links transport uh, kind of transport well, well these connections trade connections with russia you know maybe something can be done around like you know not bypassing sanctions, but but some arrangements arrangements uh, can be made uh, um, with that. Although, uh, well, both uh, the the uh, Kazakh officials and uh, Uzbek officials they promised they promised that they will not uh, uh, be assisting, you know, the uh, bypassing of of, uh, uh, of sanctions. So. Uh, so a, a lot of thinking, <laughs> a lot of thinking is happening now in the region. But uh, so it's a situation is quite uh, it's very critical. But on the other hand, you know, kind of uh, maybe some windows are open. Okay, uh, Lisa. Lisa, sorry. Yeah, really, really quickly, I would just e echo um, uh, pretty much everything that Narka said in terms of um, well, not being a, an, a grain expert or agricultural imports expert, um, but Turkey also was not as affected as countries of the Middle East when it comes to um, to uh, constraints on grain imports. Um, although because it's Ramadan, people are paying attention to the price of of P day and they want to know exactly what that is and how it compared to last year. So there's always that kind of calculation that's taking place. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different factors, including the transport networks um, that Nargis mentioned that I think are really important in, in what's happening with prices. Um, although with, with Turkey, where we've seen the, uh, the shortage is sunflower oil. So people, that's, that's the item that everybody is queuing up uh, for is to buy lots and lots of sunflower oil. Um, in terms of the potential uh, economic opportunities, um, you know, this, this I think is also uh, a, a 
place in which Turkey finds itself in a, in a complex and, and constrained situation because it does have the potential to benefit from a lot of Russian money. Um, and one of the issues that was raised with the new German chancellor with uh, his visit with, with President Erdogan was to try to prevent the influx of Russian oligarchs um, and try to ensure that they're not circumventing sanctions by bringing their money to Turkey. Now, the Turkish government, as I mentioned, is looking towards elections and is facing an economic crisis and has a lot of desire for uh, that kind of money. Um, and so there's a lot of effort from the international community to try to put pressure on Turkey um, in order to not allow it to benefit financially. Um, we saw, you know, Roman Abramovich's yacht uh, have to leave uh, Bodrum. Um, so we'll, we'll see the extent to which those maybe public displays are in line with, uh, you know, European countries' calls. But uh, in terms of how uh, Russian money may, may be affecting the Turkish economy in other ways, we'll just kind of have to wait and see and, and look very closely. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Yeah, my understanding is there are plenty more oligarchic yachts that are currently parked in Turkish waters. Yeah. Um, all right, let me give the last word to Alessia because uh, we're just about at the end. Really yeah, I will. I will be very quick. Uh, just to add to what was already. I mean, of course, uh, one question is how to receive, uh, and the other, and then, the, like for example, I can tell you that in the in the supermarket next to my house in Belize, we already miss some of the Ukrainian products. You know, the so I mean, uh, we can already feel that. But I mean, if, uh, and but there is also another question: is how to pay. Uh, because, uh, like for example, Georgia uh, receives more than 90% of its grain from Russia, and it's fine. I mean, it can continue receiving it because, I mean, the war is in Ukraine, right? I mean, but the how to pay for it while uh, the bank transactions are not possible because of the sanctions, um, currencies, again, kind of, you know. And then what, what I have been hearing is that the companies, they are raising questions around these very issues. And potentially there are some kind of uh, some people who are worried that it can um, turn into kind of this gray zone, um, uh, which can be kind of created again problems potentially for the country um, because it will be seen something like a, attempts to avoid the sanctions uh, so I mean uh, it's not only about the supply rules but also how to pay uh, for some of these things uh, uh, while having the sanctions uh, in place okay thanks that's a good note to end on uh, we have a lot more questions and i know this is a very dynamic and complicated topic and i think we could probably stay here and discuss this for much longer um, but thank you uh all of our panelists and thank you to all of the members of the audience who are able to join us today i hope this was uh illuminating and enlightening for you um and hopefully the this war will end sooner rather than later and we won't have to do a, a follow-up to this panel so again thanks to you all thank you thank you